Now we are, we have covered a fair bit of discussion about fluids and uh, we have also uh, said a little bit um, about um, applications uh, of, of fluid dynamics in astrophysics. Now, as we said in the, in the beginning of the course, uh, magnetic fields are of great importance in astrophysics. Okay, uh, so, and, and this is something that we have not really uh, considered much, uh, magnetic fields. are very important in astrophysics, right? So now you see the thing is, but we have not considered, we have not talked about magnetic fields at all, right? We have mostly, uh, we have almost exclusively been talking about neutral fluids so far. So now I think uh, in, a, in, a, in any kind of um, discussion to uh, do with uh, fluid dynamics um, you know, as applied to astrophysics, uh, I think it's important to consider uh, magnetic fields. Specifically, so from now on we will be starting to deal with magnetized fluids. Fluids which are which have a magnetic field in it and it is important to consider these things a little carefully. So I, I, I will list out uh, what we are talking about and uh, we will proceed systematically. So essentially from now on for the remainder of the course we will be talking about magnetized fluids and once we establish the basics, the basic equation, the basic approximations and the limitations and so on and so forth. We will then uh, uh, go on to uh, uh, starting to um, you know apply uh, these concepts to uh, astrophysical applications. So let us start with the basics first, right? Uh, this field is called magnetohydrodynamics. It's a bit of a mouthful, but you understand wh you know what this means. It's hydrodynamics, right? It's hydrodynamics, which is what we've been talking about so far, uh, with magnetic fields. Hence the name magnetohydrodynamics. And so the first thing to note is that it is a fluid description. Okay? So all the, usual, all the usual approximations that we made to, to define fluids, they hold here too. So it is a fluid description first of all. What that means is that we are essentially banking on the assumption that is, it is good enough to describe things in terms of the moments like density, velocity, temperature and so on and so forth, right? You remember this is what we did in, in, uh, in, in, in dealing with fluids as well. Uh, we were considering only the moments of the distribution function such as density uh, which would be the zeroth moment, velocity would be the first moment, temperature would be related to the second moment and so on and so forth. So it is the same thing here too, right? So we are certainly not doing individual particle motion, no not at all. For instance, orbit theory. What this means now, this this might be some uh, somewhat unfamiliar. Uh, this particular word. What this means is that consider a magnetic field. Yeah, consider a magnetic field like so. Yeah, consider we we will normally use the uh, symbol B to denote magnetic field. So consider a magnetic field like so. And uh, what does a charged particle do when when it's, it 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 uh, encounters a magnetic field? A charged particle is, is uh, subjected to what is called uh, a Lorentz force which is proportional to the velocity uh, of, the, of, of the particle as well as the magnetic field. So that is one thing but more importantly the direction of the force is, is uh, uh, perpendicular to both the velocity as well as the magnetic field, right? So, so as a result the charged particle executes a circular motion. We know this, right? So it executes a circular motion uh, 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 with, with the plane of the circle perpendicular to the, uh, uh, you know, uh, to the magnetic field, okay? So that is one thing. 
Second thing is of course, if it already had a, 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 a component of velocity that was parallel to the magnetic field, if it already had a V parallel, then that is unaffected by the presence of the magnetic field. So, as a result, the particle executes a helix. Okay. So, this is what an individual particle would look like and hence the name and these are orbits. Okay. And so, you know, there is an elaborate theory, I mean one can go on trying to describe these orbits. For instance, what would happen if the magnetic field was curved? I mean, you know, would you need to follow the orbits all throughout or what or so on and so forth. And so, this is the purview of orbit theory, but we are not doing orbit theory here. We are doing fluids. It is important to, as we go along to recognize and realize what we are doing and what we are not doing. In this case, it is important to realize that we are not looking at individual particles and therefore, we are not doing orbit theory. That was obvious even from here. We are not doing individual particles. We are actually not even doing distribution functions of particles. We are doing, we are concentrating only on the moments of the distribution function like density, velocity, temperature and so on and so forth. Okay. Uh, yeah, so, so the other thing is we are not even concerned with the distrib particle distribution functions. We are concerned only with the moments of the distribution function such as density, velocity, temperature. All of this is I realize a repetition. Okay. I just want, you know, just want to emphasize this once again because we, we, uh, we are now, you know, starting to a slightly uh, new field of study that of magnetohydrodynamics. So, it is important to emphasize what is similar to fluids and what is not similar to fluids. Okay. Now, although we are not considering individual particles, we are not even considering distribution functions and so on and so forth, this approach that of magnetohydrodynamics is surprisingly effective and uh, since the level of detail is low by way of say, I mean what I really mean by low is that you know, uh, this, this theory is incapable of addressing the distribution function. It certainly cannot follow individual particles around. So, it is it's kind of a coarse, it is a coarse grained theory. But because of that, the theory is quite flexible and it is capable of addressing a reasonably large uh, range of phenomena. It is very, very useful which is why we studied. Okay. Um, there are apart from the basic magnetohydrodynamics, you know, um, framework that we will lay out. There are sophistications uh, such as a multi-fluid treatment. For instance, uh, one would, uh, one might want to, um, you know, uh, consider electrons and uh, protons or electrons and ions as two separate fluids. Okay. An electron fluid and ion fluid. That would be a multi-fluid treatment. The other thing is even though particle, individual particle, um, you know, motion is not being considered, you know, uh, this is what is called a Larmor orbit by the way. I should explain this, this adjective a little. So, uh, consider a magnetic field that is, uh, you know, into the plane of the, pa uh, into the plane of the screen and, and uh, you know, uh, and a charged particle that is gyrating like so. This is called Larmor motion and so, the, the radius of gyration is called the Larmor radius. This would be the Larmor radius. So, even though we are not considering individual particle motion in its full glory, uh, one can modify a fluid uh, treatment to uh, to account for the presence of, to account uh, uh, for the fact that the Larmor radius is indeed finite. Okay. Uh, in as such, in principle, in magnetohydrodynamics, there is no Larmor radius at all. Okay. So the Larmor radius is technically zero when you are doing pure magnetohydrodynamics. There can be a, a higher level of sophistication uh, where we take into account the fact that uh, the Larmor radius is non-zero and so these are called finite Larmor radius corrections. So, but these are all, you know, uh, um, uh, higher level treatments. I, ju I just wanted you to be aware of it. We will not be doing any of these. Okay. We will only be concentrating on this much. That is all we will be concentrating on. Okay. Right. So, now, what are the basic assumptions and what are the basic approximations that are made in this approach? Very, very important, right? We should, we should be very well aware of, of the basic assumptions and approximations before going ahead. Well, one of the main assumptions is the fluid approximation that we have already discussed. The other thing is that the plasma, the medium is electrically neutral. This is very, very important to remember. 
okay even though even though the fluid comprises charged particles this is very important to keep in mind this is something that many students make uh, mistakes uh, in, in, in understanding you see the fluid now we are talking about is 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 you know a charged fluid in that it, it has electrons and protons or electrons and other other uh, heavier ions okay so the particles are charged okay this is the uh, examples are for instance uh, you know your tube light the way the tube light works is uh, you have an arc discharge and uh, essentially you, you, you have a very high voltage uh, applied across the tube, across the, uh, across the neon uh, inside the tube and that creates an arc and that ionizes the gas in there. Okay? So in other words, it splits the gas up into electrons and protons or electrons and heavier ions. So the gas itself is comprised of charged particles. However, the plasma is still electrically neutral on large scales, I must say, over quote unquote large scales. Okay, so on the whole, in the bulk, the plasma is electrically neutral. Very important to keep in mind, even though the constituents of the plasma are charged particles. Okay, important to remember. In other words, it is not applicable at scales where this quasi-neutrality is violated. So you know, it's 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 uh, it's like this. You have uh, you know uh, a scale, say the Larmor radius scale, uh, a scale of a Larmor radius. Uh, you would have a scale of charge separation, for instance. In other words, the kind of scales where you would say that a positive charge and negative, you would be able to make out that a positive charge and negative charge are separated by this amount. Okay, And then you would have the largest of these would be the MHD scales which is much larger than the Larmor radius, even larger than the charge separation scale. Okay, It would be much larger, say from here to here or so, very large, so that you are not able to figure out the fact that there are individual charges in the fluid. However, the fact that there are individual charges in the fluid is very important because that's what leads to this uh, to the fact that um, uh, you know magnetic fields can be sustained. So it's a bit of a you, you have to keep these slight contradictions in mind. Okay, so it is applicable only at large scales. At smaller scales where the, the, this this quasi neutrality is violated, okay, uh, MHD the, the the theory of uh, magnetohydrodynamics is not applicable. Very important to keep in mind. Right, and then. There is a local and instantaneous relationship between the current and the, and, and the electric field. Technically, uh, uh, we are really talking about the current density, J, which is the current density is equal to some kind of sigma times the electric field. So, this is this is the conductivity. So, this is essentially like an Ohm's law, except you have seen Ohm's law being applied to discrete circuits where you know V equals IR kind of thing. There is an Ohm's law in the sense that this is relating J to E. Okay? So, there is a local and instantaneous relationship between the current and the electric field technically the current density and the electric field and in between you have the sigma. Okay? Now, the sigma can be a scalar, but it need not be. You see, you have a vector on this side. So, uh, J would be a vector and so is the electric field. The electric field is also a vector. So, in between what do you have? You could possibly have a matrix. So, this could be sigma. Right? This would be E 
and this would be j, j x, j y, j z, e x, e y, e z and in between in principle you can have a matrix, right. So, it is possible that, that the off diagonal terms of the matrix are all 0 and you just have the diagonal terms and they are all equal in which case sigma is just a scalar, but not necessarily, okay. So, so that is what I mean by this. So, sigma uh, as such. In other words, what, what, what we are saying is the sigma in one direction is not the same as this. One can allow for the fact that the sigma is anisotropic. One can allow for the fact that the conductivity is anisotropic, but we would not really bother with these complications. We will just go ahead um, with, with uh, simply thinking that, you know, the sigma, uh, the conductivity is just a scalar. Additionally, the following assumptions are commonly used the fluid is infinitely conducting. Uh, uh, conducting. In other words, um, you see this j equals sigma e, uh, this guy, this thing, sigma is technically infinite. Now, you might say, oh, wait a minute, there is a problem here. If sigma is technically infinite, in which case, you know um, that would that would either mean an infinite current or a vanishingly small electric field. Yes, there are some problems here. Okay, uh, there are some issues here, but keep this in mind, and we will come back to it. Technically, what it means is that the electric field, i.e., the electric field. is vanishingly small. So, you see th th this is one way you can satisfy uh, the requirement that sigma is infinite, right. If the electric field is vanishingly small, even with a finite current density, you can have, uh, uh, a, you know, a, a, an infinite or, or a, a arbitrarily large um, uh, conductivity. You can you can uh, manage this, right? So um, so this is another important assumption in magnetohydrodynamics that this is, uh, fluid is infinitely con uh, conducting. Equivalently, the electric field is vanishingly small, essentially zero. There is no dissipation. In other words, it ties with this. Infinite conductivity means almost zero resistivity, so there is no resistive dissipation. Okay, so I should probably say there is no resistive dissipation, okay. There is no resistive dissipation. So, this is another important thing to uh, note. So, um, okay. So, these are the assumptions of, of uh, magnetic hydrodynamics. So, within these assumptions, uh, what are the limitations? So, this, this is, I mean, we, we said that uh, this is what we are going to consider, okay. Uh, uh, we are not going to consider a theory that is any more sophisticated than this. So, now it is important to ask before launching into the details of the theory, it is important to ask uh, what are the limitations of this theory? Well, first of all, obviously a fluid description should be justified in that uh, there should be many particles within a, uh, within a given macroscopic volume, you know the usual fluid thing. Equivalently, there should be many collisions between a, a given macroscopic time scale, right. In other words, uh, 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 whatever time scale of variation you are considering, it should be long enough so that there are lots and lots of interparticle collisions, okay. Or there should be many collision mean free paths within a mac macroscopic time scale. These are all the familiar fluid, um, you know, restrictions uh, that, that, that we know. This is nothing new. Uh, we we uh, elaborated on this uh, towards the beginning of the course. So, that holds now too, okay. So, that is number one. In many ways, this restricts us to low frequency phenomena, okay. So, this is something to, to in other words, high frequency phenomena like plasma oscillations are outside the purview of MHD. Now, it is important since we have not, um, you know, encountered this term before, what are plasma oscillations, right? It is like this. Consider for instance, we are uh, talking about, you know, a um, uh, fluid which comprises of charged particles, okay. But then, you know, the fluid is infinitely conducting and so on and so forth. So, essentially, you see, 
uh, in, in any system, let, let's simply consider the fluid to be comprised of, uh, you know, electrons and protons. Protons are very heavy. They are 2,000 times more massive than the electrons, right? So it's essentially any mobility should be, um, you know, uh, assigned only to the electrons, okay? So the electrons are almost infinitely mobile, whereas the protons are just sitting in their place. Uh, con consider, uh, in, you know, uh, and we said that the plasma is large scale electrically neutral, right? Now consider a sheet of electrons like this, okay? There are many, many sheets, many such sheets, but consider a sheet of electrons that is displaced to the side for some reason, okay? For some reason, I decide to displace this sheet of electrons. Now what happens, okay? There is another sheet of electrons at, at its original place. So that will repel it, but there's also, you know, there are also protons here. There are electrons and protons, right? So you displace this sheet of uh, electrons and that is, there is an attractive force that brings it back to its, that tries to bring it back to its original position, okay? And what's more, it might overshoot its original position, right? And then it's subject to the attractive force yet again, okay? And so, what happens is there's an oscillation. So the sheet of electrons oscillates. Much like, much like, uh, you know, mass attached to a spring, okay? The, the spring is essentially the Coulomb attraction, okay? So you have, what you do is you displace a sheet of electron either to the right or to the left, either way, okay? It's attracted back by the positive charges that are always there, but they're kind of immobile, okay? Because they, the protons are so heavy that they're kind of immobile, right? It swings back, but it does not stop at its original equilibrium position. It, it overshoots and then it swings back again and so on and so forth. It's, it's essentially simple harmonic motion. And these are what are called plasma oscillations, okay? And the frequency of plasma oscillations, uh, the frequency of plasma oscillations is proportional to the square root one half power of the electron density, okay? And these are what are plasma oscillations, but these are high frequency phenomena. MHD cannot deal with these plasma oscillations. It cannot resolve these plasma oscillations. The frequencies at which, the temporal frequencies at which magnetohydrodynamics is applicable is well above the plasma oscillation frequency. So plasma oscillations, the MHD theory, the magnetohydrodynamic theory is blind to plasma oscillations it cannot resolve, okay? So it's, we are really restricted only to low frequency phenomena, frequencies that are, and in physics, you always, whenever you say, you use words like high or low, you should always, you know, say with respect to what? Well, low frequency with respect to the frequency of plasma oscillations, for instance. Okay, plasma oscillations are considered to be high frequency phenomena. So, so plasma oscillations are, are, are very interesting phenomena, but this is something that cannot be captured by this theory. Okay, this also means the charge separation effect, which go hand in hand with plasma oscillations, of course, you know, like we said, you know, uh, 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 the whole point of uh, plasma oscillations is that charges are being separated from their, uh, from their equilibrium positions. You, you, um, you know, displace a sheet of negative ch uh, charges from their equilibrium position. And because of the fact that it's separated from its equilibrium position, there's an electrostatic attraction towards its equilibrium position and then it, it comes back and then oscillates. So, back. so charge separation effects cannot be dealt with in magnetohydrodynamics. So this is another thing, right? Yeah, they cannot be addressed. The other thing is that very, very important, electric fields are absent. Okay, uh, this is a direct consequence of the fact that the conductivity sigma tends to infinity, right? And the conductivity is where you get it's like this, 
this is the Ohm's law that we discussed earlier. So, this conductivity tends to infinity. So, that is why electric fields are absent. You can look at it in this in, in the following way which we have already discussed. We can say well if the fluid is infinitely conducting and you insist on a finite current density in that case there is only one way out the electric fields have to be very have to be vanishingly small that is one way of looking at it. The other way of looking at it is that the way you get infinity, infinite conductivity is to, to um, you know assign infinite mobility to the electrons. In other words the electrons are just like in a metal. In fact, plasma, you know, much of this applies to metals as, as well. Just like in a metal, you have a sea of free charges and they are very, very mobile, right? So now what happens if you introduce an electric field in between? What does an electric field do? It acts on the charges and it makes them move, right? Charges move in response to an electric field. Charges obey the directive of an electric field. That is what charges do. Right. Now, what happens is the moment you, since charges are infinitely mo mobile, somewhat like you know uh, an assemble, uh, assemblage of marbles with almost zero friction, right. So, you, you, you move one of the marbles a little bit, that is what an electric field does, right. Well, immediately all the other marbles from everywhere will rush in, okay, so, so as to neutralize this electric field. The electric field will be immediately shorted. By sh shorted, I mean that it will be made to go to zero. Okay. Why? This is a direct consequence of the almost infinite mobility of the electrons, which goes hand in hand with the infinite conductivity. So, electric fields cannot exist inside of an infinitely conducting fluid. So, electric fields are essentially absent in the fluid frame. Very, very important. The frame is important. Okay, as long as you are inside, you are immersed in the fluid, as long as you are in the fluid frame, you cannot observe any electric fields. Okay, but you, if you are standing outside of the fluid frame, if you are a lab observer and you are watching this charge fluid go by, you will you know, discern an electric field. We will come to that in a minute, but right now we are talking about being inside of the fluid, inside the fluid, inside this highly charged fluid. Because the fluid is infinitely conducting, you cannot have uh, any electric fields, which is also why in MHD, uh, I should say in MHD, you see only discussions about magnetic fields in magnetic hydrodynamics. This, this is a question that many people sort of you know miss. This is a point that many people miss. Uh, you, you go on, you look at the equations of MHD, so on and so forth, you see that only magnetic fields are being considered and you forget about this basic facts. After everything is done, someone asks you, but wait a minute, how about electric fields? Why did you, why did electric fields never make an appearance in your equations? This is the reason. Because electric fields are, uh, are, are by definition equal to 0 in uh, in the uh, frame of, uh, of the infinitely conducting fluid. Therefore, in magnetohydrodynamics, since the whole basis of magnetohydrodynamics is, uh, is, is about uh, infinite co conductivity, uh, uh, you only see discussions about magnetic fields. So, these are the various limitations of the theory and uh, uh, when we proceed next, we will lay down uh, uh, the, the starting equations and we will go from there. So, that is all for the time being. Thank you. Thank you.